hails the Luciferian outlaw Lance Legion Miasmus here once again, and this is the promised review of the Batman movie, The Batman. And I've been meaning to do like a full length review of this for a while. I did like a first impressions review of it, like back when it first came out right out of the theater and when I got in my truck, you know, I did like my initial thoughts on it, but I've seen the film several times since then, so I wanted to do kind of more thorough review of it, because I have reviewed like in an old video, I did a review of the uh, entire Dark Knight trilogy, which the Dark Knight is one of my favorite films of all time in a top five so, I've always loved that movie because I love the Joker, I love the philosophical underpinnings of that movie, and Batman Begins as well. I love the philosophical underpinnings of that movie, especially because Ra's al Ghul and Batman Begins just drop so many truth bombs about, you know, the world and society and all this. Yeah, it is. Well, well, the whole we live in a society commentary is actually fucking valid sometimes. So, there you go. I mean, that's just, you know, that's a rant for another time about how people just want to shut down real talk and don't want to discuss things. But, in any case, um, the Batman. Well, when it comes to the Nolan films and all that, as I said, The Dark Knight Rises is the weakest part of all those films. And when it, I was so hyped up for that movie, it came out 10 years ago in 2012. And like Batman Returns came out in 1992, 30 years ago. Just crazy to think about. I can't believe you know it's been that long since you know either of those movies really, but especially The Dark Knight Rises. I think Bane was awesome in that movie, and I think that Tom Hardy was awesome in the fight scene, the, the sewer fight scene between Bane and Batman. You know, in The Dark Knight Rises, which is awesome, and Bane has some awesome quotes there, like saying, you know, um, you know. I was born in darkness, molded by it, you know, things like that. But the ending of that movie seemed abrupt to me to close off such a popular trilogy, and it was a bit underwhelming, and Talia's death scene, Talia al Ghul's death scene in that movie is abysmal, and I, it just, it brings down the whole climax of that movie in a lot of ways. So, I think The Batman is a better movie than The Dark Knight Rises. I would place it third as the best live-action Batman movie. One would be The Dark Knight, two would be Batman Begins, and three would be The Batman. And that, But that said, The Batman is fucking awesome. Christopher Nolan had said for Batman Begins that he wanted to imagine Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner movie, uh, in a Batman-type world. Well, Batman Begins has a little bit of Blade Runner imagery, but to me, The Batman, by Matt Reeves, director Matt Reeves, The Batman, has that Blade Runner aesthetic down to a T. Like, it rains the whole movie, you know, it's night most of the time in the whole movie, just like in Blade Runner. To me, this one has that Blade Runner aesthetic more than any other Batman movie. I totally love that about this. And the opening scene is great. The Riddler is there, you know, like, oh, and just there's spoilers ahead, so, you know, and all that jazz, so whatever. Um, but you know, the, at the beginning of the movie, when the Riddler kills the mayor, like, you, it's an awesome shot. Like, you see the mayor on the phone talking, and you see the Riddler's glasses, like, in the background, him just standing there still, like he's on some Michael Myers shit. <laughs> you know, he, he's just there, 
and you're like, whoa. <laughs> and then, like, it shows him again. He's, like, just looking at the mayor, watching him, you know, back and forth. Like, and then it's quiet, and then he jumps out of nowhere and screams and just kills the mayor very brutally. It's a very brutal scene, but it's like something straight out of a slasher flick. Straight out of a horror movie. And that whole, like, it's the scene from the trailer where the Riddler's all, like, breathing heavy like Michael Myers does. And then just he takes the duct tape and he, you know, like that. And just, it was, it's awesome. And then I loved the voiceover in this movie. We get a voiceover from Batman at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie. And this movie is a journey for Bruce Wayne. He learns something at the end about vengeance, and I'll talk about that. But it was cool. Again, there's another Blade Runner connection. Uh, the original theatrical version of Blade Runner, not the director's cut and not the ultimate cut or the final cut, whatever it's called, I always prefer the theatrical version because I like the voiceover. Without the voiceover in Blade Runner, I think the film's a little... It's still good, but it's going to be confusing to someone who sees it the first time. So a voiceover explaining things helps, and it adds that whole noir, film noir aspect to the whole thing. So... This is, and you tell by the voiceover, it's a grim and nihilistic Bruce Wayne. I think Robert Pattinson, you know, even though The Dark Knight is my favorite Batman movie and one of my favorite movies of all time, if not my favorite film of all time, you know, Christian Bale's Batman is good in that, but... Robert Pattinson's Batman, I almost want to say like he's my favorite Batman because, at least in this, because he captures that vengeful, that initial vengeful nature of Batman that I think was missing in some cases. Because in Batman Begins, like Ra's al Ghul straight up tells Bruce Wayne, vengeance saved me. Of course, uh, Bruce doesn't know that. Uh, Liam Neeson's character as Ra's al Ghul at that point yet. He doesn't know that. But, like, he tells him, you know, what saved me from destroying myself was vengeance. Something along those lines. And even Bruce himself says, that's of no help to me. And it's like, well, you know, uh, here... He straight up says, I'm Vengeance, and they call him Vengeance as a nickname throughout the movie. The Penguin and Catwoman both call him Vengeance. I thought that was really cool. And I had always wanted to see a more a Batman who straight up says he's about vengeance. Not necessarily justice, but vengeance. So I really liked that aspect of it and he gives like you know we see more of Batman than Bruce Wayne in this movie and that was another problem I had with The Dark Knight Rises was we barely see any Batman in that movie we get a lot of good character moments for Bruce Wayne but we don't get much Batman and he's the titular character The Dark Knight is the titular character and there weren't a lot of Batman and Gordon moments in The Dark Knight Rises. There were in Begins and Dark Knight, but not Rises. And that was something that was missing. But here, we get a lot of good Batman and Gordon moments. And Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne is almost gothic in a way. Like, with the hair and the... Like, he looks like he could be a member of The Cure or something back in the 80s, almost. So it's like... I really dug that, and I just love this, like, detached nature of Batman. He's like, his identity is Batman. He doesn't give a shit about being Bruce Wayne or anything like that. He, I mean, he even tells Alfred, he's like, I, if I can't do this, I don't care what happens to me. 
and that's about identity. His identity is not Bruce Wayne. His identity is Batman. So that is sacred to him. So when he says that, he's like, I don't care what happens to me if I can't do Batman. So I really like that aspect of just how detached he is from the superficiality of the world and how he doesn't give a shit about being Bruce Wayne. He just wants to be Batman. So that was cool. And finally, and I love this in the trailer, I've always said, you know, when it comes to like Batman and all that, I wish Nolan would have done a fourth film. Or, I wish there would have been a third Nolan Batman film that took place in that eight-year time jump, that in-universe eight-year time jump between The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. It was four years in real life, but it's eight years in that universe time jump. And the events of Dark Knight Rises would have been a fourth film. I always wanted to see a Nolanized, if you can call it that, a more, or at least let's just say a more realistic version of the Penguin and the Riddler, which we got in this movie, but we finally get to see what the Penguin would be like in a more gritty, grim, and realistic sense, and this is awesome. I mean, I thought Colin Farrell as the Penguin was excellent, and I'm glad the character's still alive at the end of the movie, as is the Riddler. So we'll probably see these characters again if this universe continues. So, I mean, it isn't just a good penguin. It's a great penguin. He's not a mutant like Danny DeVito was in Batman Returns, where it's kind of like kids may find it scary, and it is a little creepy if you saw someone coming in looking like that or whatever. Yeah, but it's also... Uh, you know, Colin Farrell's Penguin isn't campy like Burgess Meredith's Penguin from the 60s Batman. You know, like you make the Penguin like this tough guy. He, he's a tough guy. And he also has some very witty quips when he's dealing with Batman and Gordon. But you can tell he's like a mafioso, a mafioso tough guy. And at the end of the movie, he assumes power. Essentially, like we see him looking out the window there at the flooded city like he knows, you know, with Carmine Falcone gone, you know, he, he, he's the head of the mafia now, of the organized crime in Gotham. He's going to seize power. You know, he is like a mafioso tough guy. His face is scarred. He has a little bit of a pointy nose. So you can tell, you know, it's the Penguin. You know, for sure. And he's a bigger guy, you know, too, and all that. It's definitely the Penguin. You know, he's like a big, big old, like, just like a uh, bruiser type is what I'd say. So, you know, Colin Farrell is, is great in this movie. I loved seeing a realistic version of the Penguin. I wish we would have seen that in a Nolan film. Like, in the trailers, when I finally see the Penguin, he says, take it easy, sweetheart. I'm like, hell yes. That's, that's awesome. And then I just love the car chase scene with the Penguin, you know. <laughs> like, uh, this is probably the best car chase in a movie I've ever seen, other than the car chase in The Dark Knight <laughs> with the Joker. Like, yeah. You know, so the Dark Knight and the Batman have the two best like car chases I've ever seen in a movie. Um, yeah, like the car chase with the Penguin is excellent. And I love the Penguin's like little quips when he's trying to get away from the Batmobile. And that Batmobile is badass. Like when the Batmobile is introduced, when Batman interrupts like the drug the drug buy scene and all that trying to capture the penguin so they can question him about the Riddler again. Uh, when the Batmobile is introduced and it makes those wow noises and all that, it reminds me of the John Carpenter flick Christine, if you've ever seen that. Yeah, Christine is a very enjoyable movie. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, I love that movie as a kid. Uh, and it just reminds me, yeah, again, there's a lot of horror movie elements here. 
they make the Batmobile kind of like its own character there. It's scary. <laughs> like at first, like the Penguin's looking at it, and Gordon's like, what the fuck? You know, Penguin's like, what the fuck? And even uh, Catwoman, you know, Selena Kyle, when she sees it, she's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and so, like, it was pretty cool. Uh, and, like, to say that, the horror movie elements, I mentioned the Riddler at the beginning, when Batman is first introduced, when he beats up the uh, gang that's assaulting the guy at the beginning off the subway and trying to, you know, assault him, basically, for initiation, you hear those footsteps coming out. That's like an old-school Western trope, where the footsteps, you hear the spurs, you know, on, a, like, some outlaw's boots or something coming. Well, here you hear his boots stopping, and it's really a nice trope. Batman doesn't come down suddenly and start doing things. He comes very slowly and methodically, and when he emerges from the darkness, like, the first time I saw that in theaters, I was like, holy fucking shit, man. As a long-time Batman fan, I saw... Batman 89 in theaters when it came out. My parents took me to see it. And that's what made me a Batman fan for life. My uh, parents were already Batman fans, but they took me to see this. And I was a Batman fan for life. I just thought it was the coolest thing I had ever seen at that point. And here, when Batman emerges, it almost made me feel that way again. Like, it is nostalgic in a sense, but no, this is totally different, though. This is totally new. Like, when I walked out, I was like, holy shit. And he, and this Batman is, like, merciless in battle in a lot of ways. At least at first he is. So, yeah, I mean, it's a great Penguin, though. I just love this realistic portrayal. Just like I love the realistic portrayal of the Riddler. And while we're at realistic portrayals, Catwoman was good. Um, I thought um, Zoe Kravitz, who of course is the daughter of Lenny Kravitz, and I do as a you know a musician, I like uh, some of Lenny Kravitz's music. Of course, you know uh, one of the first songs like I ever learned was uh, "Are You Gonna Go My Way" on on guitar when I used to play guitar many years ago. I ended up switching to bass guitar later on, but yeah, uh, but that's an aside. Uh, she, in this film, is more developed and realized as Catwoman than Anne Hathaway's Catwoman was. Anne Hathaway's Catwoman, yeah, she was beautiful as Catwoman. Yes, I mean, I... I thought she was absolutely, you know, just, she was beautiful, and she was good for the material in the movie, as far as, like, acting performance goes and things like that, but her character and the relationship between her and Bruce Wayne is extremely paper-thin. Like, if Selena Kyle, Catwoman, is the one that Bruce is ultimately supposed to end up with, then I think she should have been introduced earlier in the trilogy, but of course that would have been too many characters in the first two films, and it would have ruined the flow of those films, obviously, so, you know, maybe not, but I think as long as The Dark Knight Rises is, it's, it, it could, it's almost as long as The Batman, but it could have been 30 minutes longer just to develop the character more. Like, Bruce is going to trust her after what she does to him in that film. She betrays him and leads him to Bane. So, like, it was just kind of like, well, you know, why would he trust her? I mean, it, yeah, there needs to be a little more development there. I would have liked a little more development. You know, so... Here, we get that. There's plenty of development with this new version of Catwoman. And <clears throat> she's more developed and realized. I would say, still to this day, the best on-screen portrayal of Catwoman is still Michelle Pfeiffer. Because she portrayed 
you know, just this broken woman, you know, when she goes home and she trashes her, she trashes her place, you know, and like just has a complete breakdown, you know, and all that. When I, when I was a kid, I found that, you know, just sad. And when I go back and watch it now, it is still a sad scene. Yeah, I saw Batman Returns in theaters 30 years ago this summer as well. Um, I went and saw that. My parents, again, took me to see that as well. You know, ended up liking that one. But again, the Penguin is better in this film. I would say Catwoman is really good in this film because she's more realistic. But my own personal favorite would probably be uh, still Michelle Pfeiffer because her pain is very real. Her pain is realistic, even though the events of that film aren't realistic because she's like resurrected, you know, has nine lives. It's almost supernatural. But there's nothing supernatural about this film. It's just very straightforward, but still, you know, and just as an aside, you know, this film is not a woke, quote-unquote, film at all. There's one line from Catwoman that people talk about that could be considered woke, but she's not, I mean, she's not wrong in what she says, and furthermore, well, let me resend that a little bit. She's proven wrong in a sense because, you know, she does, she says that line to Batman and she doesn't know that Bruce Wayne is Batman. She also insults the Waynes. She knows not all people of a Caucasian persuasion are so privileged. And then she's proven wrong, but she's not wrong in her initial perception in the sense of the rich and the powerful, if that makes sense. I guess what I'm trying to say, probably not explaining that very well, but what I'm saying is, uh, from her character's perspective, of course she would think that, and she would be like that, and she would think that way. So, it makes sense, and it does not take you out of the movie. It's right in a lot of ways. But she's proven wrong because Batman himself is white. And then the Riddler is white. And what we find out about him, they're like, holy fucking shit. Holy motherfucking shit. You know, he's like the Batman, you know, like the juxtaposition between Bruce Wayne and the Riddler. His kids is shown there. You know, the Riddler as a kid, you know, grew up with no privileges and not even many necessities, much less privileges. So, we're saying that a little bit. She is proven wrong, and I think that was the point of the line. You know, it's not about this wokeness and all that. It's about uniting people. So, you know, yeah, this movie is not woke. They stayed away from that. They kept all of that you know, kind of left-wing morality in check. And I hope they continue to do so in future films because it made this film very enjoyable because it takes you out of, you know, it is escapism. It takes you out of the real world and into, you know, the world of the Batman. And I hope, I hope they just don't ruin this shit down the line in the sequel or the third film because there's going to be three movies, a new trilogy. So, you know, they kept that in check. Now, Batman and Gordon, I love the scenes. The actor, all the principal actors in this movie brought their A game. All the, that, all the actors that played the principal characters in this movie brought their A game. You know, um, like, so Jeffrey Wright is excellent as Gordon. I thought he was just a pragmatic guy. He's the only cop. He, he's like, he really does seem to be the only honest cop in the entire city of Gotham. <laughs> and, like, even at the end of the movie, like, when the new mayor is elected, you know, and and all that. It's almost like, well, can we trust her? <laughs> it's like those funny uh, 
Batman skits. Like he's like Harvey Dent. Can we trust him? You know. Like, so we start, you know, thinking about all that stuff. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google um, Pete Holmes Batman. Those skits are hilarious. But uh, like, yeah, like even at the end, you know, you don't really know who you can fully trust. You know, is the new mayor going to end up being corrupt? You know, as and we're just going to have the whole cycle all over again. It seems like you can trust her, but we don't know yet. I mean, I guess we'll have to see to the sequel. She seems honest, uh, so we'll have to see. You know, but I love the interaction between Gordon and Batman. You know, and that was something that the Nolan films, the first two Nolan films, did really well, but the third one kind of dropped the ball on. And we have a vengeful Batman, he inspires others to be vengeful. And I thought what was kind of not an inversion per se, but a different take on the trope of like the villain is the last one to be fought after all of his henchmen have been defeated. Well here we kind of see an inversion well I'd say a different take on that trope where, you know, the main villain is captured because the Riddler turns himself in after he kills Falcone. And it's interesting because the Joker in the Dark Knight, and I pointed this out in videos in the past talking about the Joker, the Joker in the Dark Knight, he's not just killing cops and corrupt politicians and, and all that. He's killing mafiosos as well. The mafia is a power structure. The cops and the law are a power structure. And that's why the Joker is nihilistic in that movie. Because he's tearing down two different and opposing power structures at once. The Riddler does that here as well. The Riddler's killing mayors, you know, and cops, and he kills the head mafioso in the city. Of course, they all work together. He killed the, you know, the DA and the, and the cops and the lawyers. Really, in the Batman, it's all one power structure in a lot of ways, but it's supposed to be two opposing power structures. The Riddler... You know, does that here. He's destroying two completely different power structures at once. And I find that interesting. But the Riddler turns himself in after he assassinates Falcone, the head of the Mafia. And, you know, he talks with Batman and great acting in that um, scene in Arkham there. Like, an it reminds me of the interrogation scene in The Dark Knight. You know, great acting there because we, you know, Batman thinks that the Riddler knows his true identity and we can see, like, the wheels turning just in Robert Pattinson's eyes when the Riddler's taunting him with Bruce Wayne and, like, Batman's not looking him in the eye, you know, he's looking down, he's like, he's gonna reveal my identity. But then we find out, no, in fact, he doesn't know that Batman is Bruce Wayne. A nice little twist there. And then Batman looks at him relieved, like, oh, he doesn't know. That's just a great moment in the film. Great moment. And, like, I love that whole scene. And then the Riddler's henchmen, this is the, the, the trope, the different take on the trope I was talking about. The... The Riddler's henchmen do his dirty work after the main villain has been captured. I thought that was interesting. So, you know, and the thing is, like, Batman has been against vengeance and for justice in, especially in Nolan's trilogy. Well, as you know, philosophically on this channel, I'm a mercenary nihilist, so I believe in vengeance. I believe in 
cosmic vengeance upon the just and the unjust alike. And as a Luciferian nihilist, uh, vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. That's why I always wanted to see Batman be actually vengeful. But if he was actually vengeful, maybe he couldn't really be Batman and we wouldn't have all these stories, which I'll get to in just a second. But, you know, I'm connecting... I love the philosophical underpinnings of Batman movies. That's why I'm connecting this to philosophy here. So, Batman finds out at the end he's inspired others to be vengeful when he, um, and as far as another thing, the woke, the woke thing and all that, uh, people talked about how uh, Selina saves Batman's ass at one point. Well, Batman saved her from being killed from Falcone before that. And then, yeah, she saves him, but then he saves her again directly after that when one of the Riddler's thugs is going to kill her. You know, he takes that shot of adrenaline, which was really intense, actually, and then beats the shit out of that thug. And then when that thug is unmasked by Gordon, we see it's that same guy that Bruce Wayne ran into earlier at the mayor's funeral that was ranting on, you know, on and on about rich people, you know, and, and shit like that. So, he says, I and mean, Gordon asks, who the hell are you, or something like that. And then uh, the guy says, me, I'm vengeance. You thought he was going to say, me, I'm nobody, like the Riddler said earlier in the movie. That's another thing. I love that um, when the DA is tied up there, you know, or, you know, with the bomb around his neck and all that, or, and, like, the phone call with the Riddler, I liked how they incorporated, like, social media and all this and all that, uh, how the Riddler someone like that, uh, you know, a subversive like that, uses social media to his own advantage and things like that to inspire people uh, to do his own bidding or brainwash people to do his own bidding. But, you know, he says, that, you know, the Riddler's goon says, I'm vengeance, and then Batman looks at him like, what the hell did you just say? Because earlier in his voiceover at the beginning of the film, he says, I don't know if I'm making a difference because murders and crimes are up. But then at the voiceover at the end, he says, I have made a difference here, just not the one I intended. Vengeance against, you know, anybody or, you know, vengeance won't change my actions of the past or anyone else's actions of the past. I have to become more, he says. As he has to become more than just vengeance. I think he wants to become hope for the people. But for me, you know, I do believe in vengeance personally, but this has been a thing with Batman, even in the Nolan trilogy. He wasn't about vengeance. He was about, I would say, maybe a personal sense of justice rather than vengeance, but bringing hope to people to let them know that there's someone out there watching them. Like, okay, all these people are, you know, nefarious out there and they're criminals and I'm scared of them, but then again, there's someone out there who is watching over me. You know, and they want that, you know, Batman wants to be that somebody. So it is noble, in a sense there, that, um, you know, Batman wants to be something more than vengeance. Though I do think it's interesting to see Batman as just vengeance. But if Batman was vengeful, he would kill his enemies. And then we wouldn't have a movie franchise and we wouldn't have a show <laughs> you know you know and all those things so 
yeah, Batman is not the Punisher. But, you know, he's writing his voiceover at the end. You know, the scars can still have mental effects even after the physical wounds have healed. They can destroy us or they can give us strength. And as Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But it also reminds me of Joker's version. Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stranger. And then my own version, what doesn't kill you likely makes you sinister. You are vengeful in a way. But Batman is not the Punisher. You know, he's not just about vengeance. He wants a sense of justice, as it were. You know, but, you know, as Ra's al Ghul pointed out to Batman, you know, Bruce Wayne in Batman Begins, you know, your compassion is a weakness your enemies will not share. And that is true in a lot of ways. And I've gone on about compassion in past videos on this channel, so you can watch that as well. Um, I guess what I'm saying here is I think it would have been cool if we saw a Batman that was just completely vengeful the whole way through. I'm vengeance is going to be his catchphrase, as it were. And it is his catchphrase in this film because everyone calls him that. But he becomes something more. If we saw a Batman that was vengeful and killing all his enemies, people probably would be like, well, how's this going to work? <laughs> you know, in the long term, as far as storytelling goes. But this is the closest live action on screen that we've seen to an actual vengeful Batman. And going forward, what villains would I like to see? In closing here, sum up, you know, uh, I will just say this. This film is awesome. I love the atmosphere of it. Very Blade Runner-esque. It doesn't top the Dark Knight, but uh, it comes very close to equaling the Dark Knight overall. As well as Batman Begins. It has great rewatch value. I don't really care about the length of the movie because, you know, overall I like long movies. The Dark Knight itself is actually pretty long to begin with. So, you know, you have that. Uh, but in the next film... I'm, I'm glad we've already seen what I wanted to see, like realistic versions of the Riddler and the Penguin. Finally, and I love the Riddler in this movie, like total serial killer, this Michael Myers-esque kind of thing going on. A slap, that costume looks, looks like the costume a killer would wear in an old school slasher flick from the 80s, like the Prowler, if you've ever seen that. So, there you go. Um, what would I like to see going forward? Um, we should see some villains that we haven't seen on screen, really, in Batman films. They've hinted at the Joker at the end of this movie, at another incarnation of the Joker. There's, a, I think, a really good deleted scene that mirrors the interrogation scene in The Dark Knight between Batman and the Joker. I like it. I think they should have left that scene in the movie, quite frankly. It wouldn't have taken away from it at all. It would have added to it, I think. Um, I guess we're going to see a, an incarnation of the Joker uh, out there in the world at some point, but apparently Batman's already encountered this version of the Joker. And he's already incarcerated in Arkham, and they already know each other, apparently. So, there's the whole arch-nemesis thing going on already. But, as far as films, I mean, I would really like to see the Scarecrow be a main villain in the film. <clears throat> or in a film, because, obviously, um, Cillian Murphy as Scarecrow in the Dark Knight trilogy was awesome. Cillian Murphy's a great actor, and he, the dude rules, Peaky Blinders and all that, but 
I would love to see a more realized version of the Scarecrow as a main villain in a film, because he would totally fit in with the atmosphere of this universe. Absolutely. I'd want to see him as a main villain. I don't think we're going to see Bane and Ra's al Ghul in this Bat universe, because... They were the League of. They were part of the League of Shadows and Nolan's films, and the League of Shadows were the overarching villains of that trilogy. So I don't think they're gonna tread that same water again. We're not gonna see that. I don't really care to see Poison Ivy because. You know, they'd probably make her some kind of, like, you know, eco-terrorist or something like that. I, I just really don't care to, to, like, see some kind of, like, pseudo-communist villain in, in there, you know, spouting off a bunch of moralistic nonsense about this, that, whatever. So, no, but it could be interesting if it's done in a non-moralistic, preachy manner. No Harley Quinn. We've already had Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. You know, just, uh, you know, kind of just sick of Harley Quinn, you know, already. She's been in, what, four films with Harley Quinn, maybe three, I don't know. I don't watch superhero movies other than Batman movies, so I don't know. I didn't care for Batfleck, by the way. I don't really count that as standalone Batman because it's live action, but it's not standalone. So I think you could have a realistic version of Clayface. You could have an actor who um, he, the, the character in himself is an actor, but he becomes you know disenfranchised or, or whatever the case may be, or, you know, disenchanted with, um, you know, his life, and he becomes like a mafia hitman or a mercenary or something, and he's someone who's really, really good at disguises and altering his voice and acting and impersonating others. So Clayface is some kind of mercenary or hitman who's just really good at disguises would work really good. I'd love to see that because, you know, Clayface in the animated series from the 90s was just pretty scary and intimidating a lot of times. So, but yeah, to make that character realistic, that could work. Uh, Black Mask would be cool. Um, Roman Cyanus, I think, is the character's real name. Uh, he could be like a foil of Bruce Wayne. He's like a rich guy, you know, and all that. He could either be someone who's powerful in crime or his own vigilante. You know, speaking, you know, like, who... I would love to see someone who's, a, again, like a vengeful vigilante for Batman to go up against. Like, you have a vigilante who doesn't kill... Batman, and then a vigilante who does kill, but very, very sadistically and brutally, someone like Azrael, or they could reimagine Black Mask like that as well. I'd love to see, because that's something I wanted to see in the Nolan films as well, a vigilante similar to Batman, not like a villain, like Joker or Riddler and all that, but a vigilante that's similar to Batman, but kills um, without remorse and without mercy and sadistically and brutally. And I think Black Mask or, uh, you know, Azrael would work there. Very good. I'd love to see that. Um, You know, other villains, like I said, I don't think we're going to see Bane, you know, in this series and all that. Um, will we see a new version of Two-Face, Harvey Dent, you know? Harvey Dent was an important part of the Nolan trilogy as well. I'd love to see a more realized version of Two-Face where he's Two-Face for, like, years. 
long time. You know, Two-Face dies pretty quickly in the Nolan trilogy, but I love to see a version of Two-Face that, you know, was an ongoing or recurring villain for Batman. So, you know, that would be cool. But I would also love to see, you know, people have talked about Mr. Freeze. I don't know how you would make Mr. Freeze realistic. You know, if they decide to go that route, I'll tell you, I'll be very interested to see how they would do that, because we all know Arnie played Mr. Freeze in Batman and Robin, which is a terrible movie. It's one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, but, you know, we need a more realistic version of Mr. Freeze. I'd be interested to see how the hell they would do that. He's a little too sci-fi, though. I mean, like I said, it'd be easier to do a realistic version of Clayface, but, you know, Mr. Freeze, I don't know how they would do that. Like, this film takes place, well, I, another thing, this film takes place and starts on Halloween. Batman on Halloween, whether it's raining and all that, is just awesome. So, yeah, like, this could take place on, on Halloween season, fall season, and all that. Maybe the next film takes place in the winter, and Mr. Freeze is the villain. I'd be willing to see it and see how they do it. Be very interested. But another villain I'd like to see that we haven't seen in live action is the Mad Hatter. And I think a perfect actor to play the Mad Hatter, they would never do this. Because, um, you know, the actor himself is not like some big Hollywood actor, but he is a cult favorite amongst his friends. Um, Thomas Ian Griffith, who plays Terry Silver in the Karate Kid 3 and in Cobra Kai. Um, the way he looks now with his actual silver hair and how he's good at playing a psychotic and psychopathic villain, he'd be perfect for the Bad Hatter. I'd love to see that. Of course, if they do the Mad Hatter, they're going to, you know, cast a more, like, A-list Hollywood actor, big name and all that. But, in all honesty, uh, Thomas Ian Griffith would nail it. So, uh, there is that. Uh, those, you know, that's what I'd really like to see here. It'd be interesting to see another Joker, but I'd like to see some of these lesser... Uh, lesser known villains like have their you know have their say as well you know um, I would love to see Scarecrow in this universe like a more realized version of Scarecrow that'd be my first pick personally <laughs> but you know so there you have it wow we have gone 48 minutes here um, long ass video but you know me, that's how I roll. This is long-form discussion, and I like to be thorough. You know, I don't like to, you know, just half-ass it. But if you've made it this far, much respect, kudos to you. You know, you can always just, any of my videos, you can always just, you know, listen to them as like podcast style and then come back and, you know, where you left off and what have you so you know how I roll this is always how I roll so yes the Batman I highly recommend it I look forward to this new Batverse finally we've got another Batverse that isn't the Nolan verse or the Tim Burton Joel Schumacher universe to look forward to I just hope they don't screw it up later on please don't shit the bed with this so there you have it. You know, let's just say the Batman 9 out of 10. So, thank you for listening slash watching. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the Luciferian outlaw. Into dark triumph ride. Ave.